Welcome to Furman University. I'm Keith Munson, a trial lawyer with Womble Carlisle, Sandridge and Rice. In an effort to give back to the community, we provide a lecture series on great trials in American history. So in the Constitution of the United States, the definition of treason is extremely liberal. That is, it's very hard to convict somebody of treason against the United States. This country was founded on acts of treason, such as the Declaration of Independence. Burr thinking that the Federalists who had been in favor of John Adams during the election would throw their support to, towards him and he could steal the election from Thomas Jefferson. Uh, failed in that regard when Alexander Hamilton got the Federalists to throw their support to Thomas Jefferson under the theory that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And Thomas, that's how Thomas Jefferson became the third president of the United States. To understand the factual underpinnings of the Aaron Burr treason trial, you have to go back to the French and Indian War in 1762. Spain, in an attempt to distract Napoleon from actually invading Spain, returned the Louisiana Territory to France in 1800. When Thomas Jefferson in 1803 sent an emissary to France for the sole purpose of buying just New Orleans for $10 million, Napoleon said, hey, if you throw in another $5 million, I'll give you the entire Louisiana Territory. They say that idle hands are the workshop of the devil. No truer words could be spoken of Aaron Burr in the period after he was the Vice President of the United States. His ultimate goal was to become the king of the territory west of the Appalachian Mountains all the way to the Pacific Coast, to the Mississippi River, meet up with Wilkinson in New Orleans, have Wilkinson turn the army over to Aaron Burr, invade the bank at New Orleans and the armory, have money, have weapons, have soldiers, and then pursue a strategy of war against Spain. About that time, Thomas Jefferson sent a special envoy to the governor of Ohio, Governor Tiffin, asking him to go to Blennerhassett Island and stamp out the revolution. Burr is on the run down the Mississippi River and through Alabama and eventually gets caught in Alabama and returned to Richmond, Virginia to stand trial. So those are the underlying facts and this is now where the uh, political and legal intrigue begins with the trial of Aaron Burr. Thomas Jefferson was not gonna leave the, the treason trial of Aaron Burr in the hands of anybody except his hand-picked prosecutors. Other players involved in the treason trial of Vice President Aaron Burr include two signers of the Declaration of Independence, three officers from the Revolutionary War, three delegates to the Constitutional Convention, three presidential candidates, five attorney generals, and two Supreme Court justices. So when you look at, say, the O.J. Simpson trial, and people talk about how they had these fabulous teams of lawyers, they all pale in comparison to the teams of lawyers that participated in the uh, treason trial of Aaron Burr in 1807. So in order to prove treason, it was necessary for the United States to prove that Aaron Burr personally engaged in the act of levying war against the United States, and there had to be the testimony of two witnesses as to the same overt act of the conspiracy to commit treason. The prosecution had an endless supply of evidence about the conspiracy and little or no evidence about any overt acts. So their strategy was to provide basically 153 witnesses who were gonna testify about Aaron Burr's conspiracy to levy war against the United States and incite this rebellion. By the third day of trial, the defense team finally prevailed on Chief Justice Marshall to cut off the prosecution from its endless circumstantial witnesses on levying war and demand that the prosecution put up its witnesses concerning the overt acts. Now, we've all seen enough television shows to know that when a jury comes back in a criminal case with its verdict, it's generally we, the jury, find the defendant guilty or we, the jury, define the defendant not guilty. Well, in this case, the jury was dissatisfied with either of those choices, so they drafted their own verdict form, which read as follows. We of the jury say that Aaron Burr is not proved guilty under the indictment by any evidence submitted to us. We therefore find him not guilty. In closing, I'd like to point out some of the philosophical and historical uh, ironies of the uh, Aaron Burr trial. 
first of all, it pitted the Republicans against the Federalists in an unusual way. Generally, the Republicans at the time, the party of Thomas Jefferson, was all about individual freedom, very favorable to the, to the chaos of the French Revolution. And here they are bringing treason charges against a former vice president of the United States. The philosophical inconsistency confronting Thomas Jefferson as the champion of the rebellious chaos of the French Revolution and the Republican Party as it existed in 1800 can best be seen by reviewing a couple letters he wrote 15 years earlier with regard to the Shea Rebellion. He stated, quote, America should have a rebellion every 20 years or so. What are a few lives lost? The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is a natural manure." Close quote. Finally, in order to put Aaron Burr in his proper historical perspective and to highlight the contributions of one of my favorite historical figures, Alexander Hamilton, I would like to leave you with portions of their obituaries. Colonel Aaron Burr died at Stanton Island in his 81st year of age. Few men in the country have excited more of the public attention than the deceased. All admired the bravery and talents which rendered him such an important auxiliary in the early struggles of our country and lamented that they were perverted to unhallowed ambition. Thank you. That completes the lecture on the Aaron Burr treason trial.